Marisa Ecochella is the New York Times bestselling author of her graphic memoir, Cancer Vixen, among other bestselling books, and is an iconic New York cartoonist. In her new book, The Big Shebang, Marissa channels God the Mother in an epic retelling that begins with The Big Shebang, and the rest, as they say, is her story. Marisa is a gifted storyteller. She is brilliant, funny, and does not hold back. Her secret journey is fascinating, empowering, and has a bit of magic sprinkled along the way. We're so interested in knowing your story because clearly you've had a path that you've followed and it's probably not been the easiest of paths. No, it's really, it really hasn't. But I feel like I've always been shown the way and like the weirdest, most amazing, most magical ways from when I was in advertising. I had a Saturn return when I was 29 and I was journaling. It was New Year's Eve and I was like thinking of writing down everything I wanted for the year. And instead of doing that list, I drew myself as a blonde bombshell, which was like a character I've drawn ever since I was like three years old, right? Literally, my mom is a shoe designer and she would do these trend reports with like fabulous women wearing fabulous shoes. She actually designed shoes for Jackie Kennedy. When she was a uh, first lady, she, my mother designed the, her shoe for the inauguration, for JFK's inauguration, right? So basically, I would just imitate my mother drawing these fabulous women. And I drew myself when I was 29 on New Year's Eve in my journal with a gun in my mouth, right? Saying she was a little upset during the meeting because I basically was like hated advertising so very much. And that was my lightning bolt moment. And I basically saw my whole career in a flash. I wrote my mother was a smother. I, I literally wrote the first comic strip that I ever did, which appeared in Mirabella the ne very next year, actually, the January issue of Mirabella. And that's how I became a cartoonist and left advertising. Wow. Oh, yeah. my God. So talk about so, following your in talk about getting a download. And that was a download. I literally asked the universe. Oh, actually, here's the crazy other part of that story. So before I did that, I lit a candle and I asked every single spirit I could think of, right? I asked all the saints in heaven, the Virgin Mary, God, God, the mother, Jesus. When I actually had that epiphany moment and I saw everything in a flash, I was so startled. I have very long hair at that point. I leaned into the candle and my hair caught fire. Oh, no. <laughs> so... I had my life's purpose and then I had to get a shag. Wow. So that's that awesome. that's how I went on the cartoonist journey right then and there. Well, like Love talking it. about that, going back to when you were young, can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about growing up and having that gift and using that gift when you were that young of drawing? Well, I mean, my mom, as I said, she was a shoe designer. And after she gave birth to me, after the big phone call when Jackie called her when she was the head designer at Delman, okay, the phone call went like this. This is kind of funny. Hello, can I speak to the designer? My mother in her Jersey accent said, I'm the designer. She said, this is Jackie, Jackie Kennedy. And my mother's like, oh my God, you're kidding. And she said, no, it's really me. I have a size 11 shoe and I can't find anything to wear for my husband's inauguration. <laughs> so my mother says, well, I'm a size 11. We could commiserate. So literally that's how my mother wound up designing Jackie's shoe. Wow. And at the time, Jackie was pregnant with JFK Jr. And my mom was pregnant with me. So. So then my mom left her office and was working from home, freelancing, and there was little me, and she would do these trend reports and draw these women wearing her shoes, and I would literally imitate her. And by the time I was eight, I was actually completely and totally bored with them because they were not talking to me, and I needed to have like a dialogue. So we went on this vacation, and my dad decided, okay, he's going to splurge and take us to Bermuda. We go to this house on the fringe of this resort in this pink elephant of a house and it's got these drawings with captions on them and I was like wow I never thought about this but the women that I'm drawing could actually speak turns out it was James Thurber's house 
So I literally like devoured every single book that was in the house. Thurber's Carnival, The White Deer, all these old New Yorkers. And that's how I started actually having these women who would actually start talking. And then I forgot about it, went to Pratt, went into advertising, then had that epiphany moment when I had my Saturn return on New Year's Eve. So that's my story. What was the inspiration for The Big Shebang? After I had that epiphany and did this cartoon, she was a little upset during the meeting. I was working in advertising and I, during the day and at night, I was developing my comic strip called She. And it was really funny because everybody thought I was taking copious notes in meetings, but I was just actually sketching out ideas for the comic strip. And not only that, but there I am, I was like nodding out in meetings too. And everybody thought, I mean, I must have looked like a junkie because I was basically up until four o'clock in the morning and getting up at like seven, you know, getting two or three hours sleep that whole year developing this comic strip. And then while I was working on She, I had this idea called The Big She Bang. And I was also studying goddesses. I had this idea, but... And I thought it would be like a big book about she and about goddesses. And I really didn't know how to develop it at that point. And I always thought, well, God has to be a woman. When I wrote my book, Cancer Vixen, I had God as a woman. And it never made sense to me that a man gave birth to everything. And then I did the research and the female entity of God was edited out of the Bible at the Council of Nicaea in 325 by Constantine, that son of a bitch, excuse me, Roman emperor. And, you know, they basically edit everything out. There were female priests. There was God the mother. She was cut out. There were all these great saints that were cut out with great stories like Thecla, who was a saint who basically was thrown to the lions and baptized herself. She's got the most amazing story. Her mother threw her under the bus, had her thrown to the lions because she wouldn't marry like this guy and wanted to go off with St. Paul. I mean, there are so many great stories about all these great women that were edited out of the Bible. I started researching that and became enthralled with these stories and wrote The Big Shebang like two years ago. But it's like, it seems to me that you've had this nugget. Of- I've had this story and I've been developing it. I've- for decades. Yeah. For decades. I actually spent two years by myself with these goddesses writing The Big Shebang. I didn't date anybody because I was literally taking taking these books and my notepads to bed. And these goddesses are very territorial and divas and they needed my attention full on all the time. And I was obsessed with Mary Magdalene. I love Mary Magdalene. Her story is so amazing to me because did you, for instance, did you know that Mary Magdalene was a princess? Literally her father was one of the kings of the 12 tribes of Israel. No, I didn't. She was a prostitute. Well, this is what happened. She, Mary Magdalene, right? Her mother was visited by Gabriel, the archangel, just like the Virgin Mary was. But Mary Magdalene's mother didn't have ears that could hear and eyes that could see. So she couldn't see, like she couldn't see through the veil that was covering everything up. So when she gave birth to Mary Magdalene, suddenly she could see Gabriel and she realized that she had a special daughter, but her husband husband, the king, wanted none of the daughter, wanted to have a son who would be the heir, okay? So Mary's mother sends her off to school in Egypt. Mary comes back, and she's a beauty, and she is enlightened, and her father sent her off to Babylon when she was 16 in a caravan with her maids and her drivers, and her dowry, and the road to Babylon is really, really dangerous, right? And she was supposed to marry the richest man in Babylon, and what happened? happened was the maids were killed, the driver was killed, and Mary was then sex trafficked and sold into prostitution. So that was her story. She made enough money to free herself and free the women. And then she went back and she met Jesus. And that's the story. And it was like this incredible story of redemption and just basically discovering her path and who she really is. Mary Magdalene was born to be the great liberator and she was born to save herself. And that is the lesson here. And she and Jesus were this incredible power couple because they were both saviors. They were the divine male and the divine female. And it's through that love that 
I think that we could learn the lesson of love of spirit, love of humanity, and balance. Balancing the male, balancing the female. I mean, they were like the original power couple, but besides God, the mother and God, the father. And if you take Mother Earth, right? What is Earth, really? The word Earth, what's that an anagram for? Heart. I feel like what we're supposed to focus on now is love and the shivolution. Yes. The divine feminine yes. must rise and balance yes. and humanity must rise. And if we want to save the Earth and we want to save humanity, that's what we've got to do as a species. I think that, you know, if you take the original story of Adam and Eve, Adam was basically, let's say, he was a piece of clay, right? And this whole myth about Eve coming out of his rib, I mean, that's ludicrous, right? That, I mean, how could that possibly be? That makes us subservient in a piece of man when we are our own entities. Mm -hmm. And that whole backstory of Eve is, I think, totally wrong. Just like everything else, all of our history, I think it's been inverted. You like read what came out of Nag Hammadi in 1947, which I call divine feminine intervention. Like Mother Earth showed us the way. Those codices were buried in Egypt and they were discovered in a red urn and they were unleashed into the world. And those stories, the story about Eve and the story of humanity, we don't even really even know, I think, our real history. I mean, there is one story, like we all know that God's only son is Jesus right? The divine son. Well, what about the divine daughter? Was there one? Right. There was. That's Sophia. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. Sophia is the number one most suppressed story in the history and history of humanity. I wear a Sophia bracelet. Okay. So, so I mean, so I mean, you know, so I do, but like most people don't talk about I Sophia. don't know. I don't know that story. <laughs> I love Sorry. it. Getting like a history I'm like, get and I want to know. know. <laughs> Here's the book, right? Yes. Can't wait. Okay. Sophia. So God the mother, right? She gives birth to God the father, as I see it. God the father was the first virgin birth. She had to come from somewhere. Then, you know, God the mother and God the father are the original power couple. So then God the mother gives birth to the aeons, the angels, and she gives birth to the Sigis, the divine son and the divine daughter. The divine daughter is Sophia. Ooh. Here's Sophia. Oh. Sophia's right? Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So Sophia and Christos, her twin flame, they're tasked with creating the human genome, the anthropos, the divine spark, the blueprint for humanity. But because Sophia is her mother's daughter, she has this spark of creativity in her. She has this need to know. And she had this creative impulse. So she wanted to go and create on her own. What happened was there is a law of creation, and that is a law of balance. There needs to be a male and female entity. Sophia bypassed that law and basically took off on her own and left the Pleroma, which is really heaven, which is where God the Father and God the Mother and Christos and all the angels live. And because she was so creative, to think basically is to conceive. And because she was so creative, her conception wasn't just mental, it was physical. So her fears gave birth to the demon or the demigod yelled about. So here she is. Wow. She's terrified that she left the pleroma. She defied God. She defied the law of creation. And she gave birth to this demigod. So the demigod wants to control Sophia. Sophia wants to hide Yaldabaoth. And then she conspires with God the mother. They get Yaldabaoth to create this man, this blueprint, which was Adam, right? Out of clay. And Yaldabaoth, was, because he was in a spirit and because he had no soul, tries to blow a spirit into Adam. But that doesn't work because he doesn't have any spirit. So then Sophia calls down to her mother and says, mom, send down the divine spark, right? Does yeah. mom send in the divine spark? And there's God the mother sending down the divine spark. And here is the divine spark right here, which is a drop. It creates the anthropos, which creates the woman, which creates Eve. And Eve was enlightened. So Eve had the soul. Eve had the soul. Had Not the soul. only did Eve have the soul, Eve breathed life into Adam. Wow. She was a physician. She was the mother of the living. Eve, because of her spark of life, has given Adam birth. Yes. Here's what happened, right? Eve was so powerful. Yaldabaoth was so 
threatened by Eve that he basically devised for the divide and conquer humanity master plan. And he said, like, they're going to implant a false memory in Adam. And we're going to just say, you know, let Eve came out of Adam's rib. So like Eve is subservient. And like, that's where that came from. Eve was a power in the power couple. Wow. Wow. Oh my goodness. Where did all of this come from? I mean, this is like, is this research? Is this intuitive in you? Is this, where did this whole story come from? Because it makes perfect sense, but I've never heard it. It comes from uh, the Nag Hammity stories. And also I kind of did a lot of research and put a lot of it together myself and also sort of let Eve speak to me. I felt like I was her channel. I mean, Eve was supernatural. She has to have the ability when they come after her, and they did come after her, she had the ability to blind them, stun them, and then her spirit left her body, went into the tree of knowledge, and her spirit was in the tree. The archons came after Eve's body. They attacked her, which is... A, a, a me too moment if there ever was one eve's body was in this tree and so to reignite her enlightenment eve the the snake who was really wisdom and the divine feminine who was also in the tree who was also eve told eve to eat the apple because the apple was the divine feminine because eve's spirit was in the apple so basically eve the snake which who was eve gave advice to Eve herself to eat from the tree, which was Eve, and Eve was the fruit. So Eve basically took a bite out of herself to re-input to put herself back into her body. And then when she was whole again, woke up Adam because Adam fell asleep. Adam was sleeping handsome. He was the original sleeping beauty and took a bite out of out of Eve, out of the divine feminine and woke up. And then they realized they were in Eden in prison because Eden was really a prison. They were enslaved by Eldabeth. And that's how they escaped prison and left Eden. Because in the Bible, they were banished, right? Because they ate from the tree of knowledge and that was taboo. They weren't supposed to do that. So it's right. like a well, completely flipped story. It's inverted. It is totally inverted. Our history is completely inverted. It was a choice to leave Eden. It was a prison. That was Eve's choice. Eve is a great evolutionary. It's amazing that the number one scapegoat of humanity is really its hero. Wow. wow. Yeah. And then there's Yeltabeth who says, you know, woman, you will give birth in pain and she says oh yeah well this is for my daughters and their daughters on to infinity and what happens is she (laughs) breathes fire and out of the fire becomes an avenging angel and she sends yells about to hell which you know he obviously didn't just stay there because well he's still the big bad yes that is fear right Mm -hmm. he symbolizes Mm -hmm. fear and that is always fear can i just ask one more question about this because now I'm I'm fascinated. Did you take it any further to Cain and Abel? I did actually go to Cain and Abel because <laughs> her, yeah. her children, right? I take it from Eve to Eve's daughter. Did you know Eve had a daughter? No. Okay. Oh. Eve had a daughter and her name is Noria, Adam and Eve's daughter. And Noria came after Cain and Abel. So Cain, because he wasn't really Adam's son, because of the attack that Eve's body sustained when her spirit left her body and that she was attacked when she her spirit was in the tree. Cain had seven fathers. And because the archons themselves were like these slithery, draconian, animal-headed freaks, basically, you know, reptilian freaks. So there's Cain, if you can see him right here. And he was bareheaded and his whole line, they were all animal headed, part human hybrids. Yeah, that was the first bloodline of humanity. The second bloodline was sired by, by Seth, right? Who was also enlightened, just like Nuria. There was a third bloodline sired by the Watchers or the Elohim, sons of gods who took the daughters of man for their wives. They produced an unholy alliance that spawned the Nephilim. You know about the giants, you know, that whole giant. Okay, yep. So that's- That was that's a real, the, like it's it's how you're bringing this to life. Right? I know. In, in a, I've heard them as stories, 
but yes. I mean, that was one of the reasons why they say that the Ark was created. But Naria, who is Eve's daughter, was actually married to Noah. Why? But, <laughs> but the thing is, like, but the thing is, like, Noah was also a hybrid. I mean, Noah wasn't such a great guy. Because when you think about it, like, he creates this Ark to basically get rid of humanity. Basically, Nuri is mentioned in the Bible, right? But not by name. She's unnamed and she's mentioned five times. And why is she mentioned five times? Because A, her name actually means beautiful fire, Nuria. She actually tried to save humanity, not once, not twice, but three times. Because like Noah was building this ark and what Nuria was doing was she was trying to take it down. Like she burned the ark down three times with her powerful voice of fire. She breathed fire. She tried to save humanity. Wow. Just even listening, it changes everything. It changes everything. I mean, our history is totally inverted. We live in a dark is light, light is dark, bad hides behind good, good is mistaken for bad, upside down world of inversion. But we can turn the world around with love and the shivolution. It once the divine feminine rises, we balance humanity and take it on. As humanity goes, so goes Mother Earth. And as Mother Earth goes, so goes humanity. We are, our futures are intertwined. At this point in time, humanity is going to make a choice. Which way are we going to go? That's basically what starts the book off anyway. It's Mother Earth leading with God the Mother Mm -hmm. to get humanity on the right path. Well, and it makes sense why that seed of an idea that you had in the early 90s is now coming to full fruition, even though you've had this incredibly successful career, both as a best-selling author, as a cartoonist, as someone standing up for women's rights and people who have had cancer. But here you are now with this book that you thought of when you were 29. Mm -hmm. And it's now coming to fruition because we need it more than ever. I feel like in a way, I'm just a conduit for these stories. I just, every morning, I just ask God the mother and all the saints. I still talk to them and channel them every morning. And I just ask them to guide me and help me and help me write this story and keep me on the righteous path. I am just like stacking the deck in my favor and asking every single saint I could think of. And Jesus and Padre Pio. So actually something crazy happened. And that was one morning I had finished about half the half the book. I had done all half the artwork. And I woke up with a voice in my head that said, Marisa, back up your computer. It's urgent. And I never did back anything up. And it was like, Marisa, back up your computer. It's urgent. I had a friend, I was taking animation classes and I had my friend Thomas, who's like an animation instructor. I'm like, Thomas, this is kind of crazy. Can you like, I've never backed anything up, but can you do it for me like right now before we start class? He's like, yeah, sure. So literally the next day I start my computer and it goes on for a split second and then nothing. I ran it over to Apple. Guess what happened? They couldn't, it started and then it died. And then they took it and it never, ever, ever, ever started again. What happened to me? So I know, oh, but you had backed it all up. I backed it up. I backed it up. But if I didn't, I would have lost a full year's worth of art work. I never would have made my book deadline. I mean, it would have definitely been a setback. And that's an understatement, right? Right. So that happened. Oh, and then I had this one goddess. Her name was Inanna. Inanna was a Babylonian Sumerian goddess. And she was so powerful. She was the goddess of goddesses. Okay. And I was like, why didn't didn't anybody ever hear of her? And I was like trying to write her in a way that made sense because there were so many different storylines. She had her own temple, Iana, and she had goddesses. And then she had this ritual where like the goddess would take the king and it was like the women were in control and they were in power. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. I just started researching her a little bit further and my birthday's on Christmas, right? It just turned Christmas, right? It was December 25th. I'm doing a little research and I discovered that the fertility ritual, like the taking Anana's place, 
They basically killed the man. Oh my God, this is on Christmas. I'm reading this. The man is killed. Kind of crazy. They <laughs> sacrificed the man. Then the goddess gave birth to a baby. When is the baby born? The baby's born on Christmas. I'm reading this on Christmas. The baby's born on Christmas. Christmas is my birthday. Then the baby's slaughtered in the spring. So it's a double, double killing. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the reason why I had such a hard time with Anana. And I had to go back and rewrite the whole thing. And I was literally shaken by the, shaken to the core by this, right? So here I am writing this book about goddesses. And like that happens. It was just nuts. I mean, that was a gift from God. You are, I was going to say, there. you are attracting it. You know, I, I so want to know what your past lives are. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I thought? Okay. Well, I think I was one of those babies who was sacrificed. That's what I felt. I felt feel that on a cellular level. And I mean, I know one of my guides is St. Michael, the archangel, you know, I've got like- Oh, those are scapulars. I have not seen a scapular. I wear them every day. Forever, wow. Well, that's why they're so close to you. But I can see the way you light up when you tell these stories is unbelievable. It's like you're, you're channeling it, but you also know it as your truth, which is what is so exciting. But I also love how you kind of put it in almost like a perspective of a superhero. Eve was really big and strong and powerful. She was literally, they say that she was like nine or 10 feet tall. Our bodies then were more light. They were not as dense. The more we sunk into matter, the denser we got. I mean, how's that for like a metaphor, right? That makes sense. It yeah. Really- and there's, they say that they have real graves somewhere in the middle East. Really? really? Okay. I mean, I'll help dig. Like, yeah, like, all right. Will you help in. me dig? Really? I'm I mean, all will you in. help me dig? Please, please. Yes. I need to find this. Talk I know. About really. Seeking. Well, and I feel like, Marisa, that you should be teaching this in addition to the, I mean, that's what you're doing with your book. You should be doing a series on all of this. Well, the knowledge just, and the passion and really? the inspiration. Yes. Like, yes. Because look, look at me or both of us, the questions that come out of this story, like people are going to walk away after reading this book book wanting more. I mean, I was thinking as you were talking, like when you wrote this book, were you writing it for yourself? Were you writing it for others? I feel like I just wanted to reach the soul of humanity. Honestly, I just wanted to speak to our truth. And I just, I think it's really about mother earth. I feel that. I really do. I do. Because she's really in danger. And so are we. And you know what the problem is? I feel like we have been, our stories and we as a people have been so suppressed and so maligned and sidelined, especially women. I mean, we're 51% of the population. There has been systemic sexism since day one, right? Let's talk about that. God the Father had to come from someplace. He was the first virgin birth. Let's get real about this. Because we're so powerful, what what does the opposing team do? Take down the strongest player, right? It happens in baseball. It happens in football. I'm going to use like a guy metaphor to get through because a lot of people can hear it if it's like a chick thing. You take down the strongest person and then everybody else falls because they're like, oh my God, our strongest person fell. Now what are we going to do? How will we defend ourselves? Well, you know what? God the mother was all powerful. She gave birth to the universe. Eve gave out. Adam life, right? She was a physician. So what do they do? They take her down. So you know what? It's time we rise up. The divine feminine must rise and we must bring up the divine male. That's why Jesus and Mary Magdalene are such a great metaphor because they're they're like the power couple that is about balance. And it's not just a male female thing. It's like we all have male female inside us. I'm not talking like gender. I'm talking balance who we are. Okay. Because when you balance the tantric snakes, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's a male female thing that's inside all of us. So that's what I mean. That's so I'm so glad you said that because I think a lot of people when they hear divine feminine, divine masculine, they do really just go to gender. We're not talking about I'm not talking gender. And people really need to understand that. Here I can illustrate my point. Here's Mary Magdalene and Jesus, right? Mary hot, by the way. You know what? Mary Magdalene was smoking hot. She was smoking. That's the legend wow. about her. She was a smoking hot redhead. Oh, wow. There Stunning. she is. Stunning. 
that's really the bracelet she actually wore. And you know how I had validation on that? I was like always going to the Metropolitan Museum, found that bracelet on Egyptian sarcophaguses. And yeah, that was like, I read that she had that bracelet and then I actually found it. That's the bracelet. Mm, that is so cool. It goes back to the Eve story, right? Like It goes back to the Eve story. It's all connected, right? Yeah. And like, that's the other thing. You think the snake is a villain? Well, the snake in the Garden of Eden was wisdom. She was, it was Eve. I mean, Sophia was the wisdom goddess. Well, I'm telling you, I wear Isis and I wear Sophia. Those are the- I big. have Isis in here too, by the that's way. I, do you know that Mary Magdalene went to the school of Isis? No, I didn't know that. I didn't even know there was a school of Isis. Seriously, Mary Magdalene, she had a mystery school, the Isis mystery school. And it was a divine feminine magic of Isis. And Mary Magdalene went to her mystery school and got her mystery school tools. And that was the raising of the Kundalini snake. I mean, Mary Magdalene was like the prize student. She mastered the raising of the Kundalini snake at a very young age. We've talked before about Jesus, right? Being schooled by the Essenes, like going off into the desert, like when he was 12. He went to the male version of the mystery school. He I went to the same. I didn't know there was a, like, again. Yeah. Yeah, because again, we live in an inverted world. We live in a world of inversion. Yeah. And I think what you said about humanity is like, this is to help save humanity. We have yeah, to come back is. to like, I was talking to my husband this morning. He's been, you know, from a political perspective, going back and forth with certain friends and trying to have dialogue. And well, at the end of the day, no matter what you think politically, we need to remember that we're all human. We are all human. And I feel like, okay, the divide and conquer humanity master plan started with Eve because she was so powerful. So they had to take her down. Then it's like, Black versus white. And then they divide us in terms of religion, yes, you know. Yes. Jewish versus Catholic versus Muslim. I mean, they divide us every single way they can. Yeah, and I feel like yeah. that's like, and now it's like Democrat versus Republican. Totally. I, wow. This is such an incredible story. And I, it's, it's, it's like, I want to know more. I feel like you've just. Well, and I think there's so much more to learn from you. And I think there's so much more to learn together. And I, I agree. Well, and one other question too, I know when we talk, like you do incorporate astrology and crystals and intuitive type readings into your life. When did that happen? Has that always been something that's been, I know we talked about that moment when you were 29, but had you kind of been into any of that prior or was it all after the fact? You know what? Honestly, I I can go back to when I was maybe about six years old. I remember my mother was going to have a hysterectomy and I was living in Roselle Park, New Jersey and going to school. And I remember like turning around and waving to my mother, right? Because she was going to, it was a day of her hysterectomy. And I saw her behind the screen door and I was like, my mother, my mother's going to die, right? It was like something terrible is going to happen to her. I don't know why I'm getting so much. It's like, I'm telling you, it's all about the mother. That day I came back. My mother was in surgery. My grandmother was taking care of me. And, and I just remember sitting on the steps and bursting into tears with my grandmother and being told that my mother almost died, right? On the operating table, they cut like some kind of something like an artery. And my father was crying. My grandfather was crying. My mother did die on the opera. Like she did die. And luckily one of the doctors came came back, but the anesthesiologist, because he felt that something was wrong because my mother's pulse was too low, saved my mom. But I knew it. I knew it. And I felt like from that point on, like I've always been able to read things. I could always tell when something's going to happen. And my mother, basically, she did have that near death experience and she did go to the light and she had all that. So my mother like sees spirits all the time. I oh. sense them. Like I see things in a flash, like I have epiphanies, right? Like I did one. Yes. Right. Yeah. But my mom, they literally like. Like that veil is just, the, the veil is not, like she just can see. Yeah, it. like that veil. Something that Aaron and I talk about often is that we have these moments, these exit points, right? Right. And that clearly was an exit point and you don't have to take it. And your mom clearly had lot, a lot more to do. My mother kept saying the names of 
all of her children and it was not her time. So she came back into her body with extreme pain, but she had like this world vision and saw everything. She saw me, my grandmother. She saw the doctor. Wow, she the her, right. Her soul came out. Her soul came yeah, out. Yeah. Her soul came out of her body. She was at the light and she was like, no, it is not my time. That's so fascinating that she did you. I thought like nobody would ever understand this, but you know, now it seems like there is a shift in humanity. Yes. So which way do you think humanity is going to go? I believe love always wins over fear. And I have deep faith, but that faith is challenged right now every single day. I believe in the light. So I believe we, we will get it right, but we are the light worker. So we have to band together, use the different skill sets and powers that we all have. I really feel that really strongly. I do. Yeah. I really feel like that's what we're here for because this is like the greatest moment in the history of the planet right here, right now, Correct. this very second. Correct. And I think we chose to be here right now. We did. Our, and, and have our journeys be what they've been so that we could do what we need to do now. Right now. Exactly. I feel I like, you know what? I have chills. I know that's validation. I totally feel this a hundred percent. I think it's because we've been able to have all of our separate journeys, the things that we have done, the, mm -hmm. the pain that we've all been through that has opened us up to being willing to tell our stories. Well, and I think for you, Marisa, with your cancer diagnosis, however many years ago and being real about telling your story, then that mm -hmm. to me opened you up to be like, like, oh, I can be real. So then it made this moment possible. Then you could take that seed of an idea that you're kind of like, I don't know how I'm going to tell the story and how people will receive it. But it was like all those other experiences showed you that being true to who you are and telling what your soul is asking you to tell is changing humanity. I hope so. I, I really hope I fulfill my purpose here. I mean, I feel like this is what I'm meant to be yes. doing and I hope I do it right. And I hope I do it I just, and I hope I don't let God the mother down because that would really crush me, honestly. I mean, there's no way that you are, honestly. You know I mean, I think the way you bring it to light is so beautiful because you're giving it the illustration. You're right. bringing it into the now. You're telling an ancient, ancient story, but you're mm -hmm. using illustration that everybody's going to be able to understand it. I mean, even like the word history. Yes. I mean, like, yes, it's, it's her. It's, it's, it's actually story. her. It's her story. It's you're right. History. You're right. It's right? her story. But I really think it's like her story needs to be heard, but our story is you. So it's history yes. and history. Yes. But like, you know, they've, there's been enough history. So You're like, so you know what? Right. You guys sit down and let us do the talking for a change. Thank you for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. We use that term every day. How do we not underscore like that? I know. <laughs> Why don't we, right? Now that we're talking about proofs, I did this story in the book about Hypatia. Now Hypatia was the world's greatest mathematician. She was a woman, like, hello, like, oh, I'm Barbie, I can't do math kind of thing. Like, which is what we were taught growing up, which is so ridiculous, yes. right? So Hypatia, like in 415 AD, lived in Alexandria. She was a genius. She was like the world's greatest astronomer, world's greatest mathematician. She was a philosopher. She taught that we were, we all come from this same divine spark. We are all one. That's Humanity right. is exactly. all one. We come from stardust. We, we are do. cosmic beings. How did that happen? How did a girl in 400 AD Yes, right. So, an education. Well, her father was also from the school of philosophy in Alexandria and they had like the great library of Alexandria. Do you know what happened to the library? They say they burned it down. There was a big fire. Are the books actually all gone? I bet they're not. Well, okay. Here's another thing. I actually did a research on this and I have Hypatia come back at the end of the book with the Virgin Mary and God the Mother. And they say that the missing books are the books that were burned in the Library of Alexandria. Did you know that the Vatican has a library. I knew you were going to say that. Maybe, so just maybe, rolling my eyes. Right. Maybe those books are in the Vatican Library under a lock and key. I have such chills. There's a ton in there. Our real history How has we, been inverted. Yeah. We are the Anthropos, enclosed in flesh. 
flesh and blood, yes. but we are God's children. Yes, we, yeah. we are all God's, God the mother and God the father's children. That's who we are. And we haven't even begun to realize how powerful we are. And that's what I think 2020 is about. We're going to get our own divine with vision yes. and wisdom. You're redefining our vocabulary from now on, even for me, like talking about God, I'll be like, God, the mother and God, the father. And God, the father. Right. So um, good. Like I'm not putting men down because <laughs> no, you know, but- I'm all about balance. My husband is, he's a balanced dude. Like he's- That's he's, awesome. He's Does he have any balance. brothers? <laughs> he's an only child. I mean, uh, but I think today's mothers are teaching their sons differently. I really do. I, I think this new generation that's coming through, is, I think they're going to be, be forced to- to I be hope so. I hope. I think we need to be a part of that education, really. I think we're humanity is either going to evolve or not. Let's like pray that we do. But I, my money is on us. Me too, hundred percent. But doesn't it seem like this is really true? We are full and and know so many fierce women, and we are sparks of God. And we are. We you know, are. And, to, and to have like that to look back to, that kind of power from God the Mother, from Eve, mm-hmm. it makes much more sense for where our will comes from. Absolutely. I agree. God the Mother was really powerful. Why else would she be sidelined? Now I'm like super interested in like looking for the books, looking for, could we find Eve? I mean, I'm going to find out. That just, would be- and, and so it's that idea of like the telling, right? The telling of the story in your beautiful and creative creative genius really in telling it I, love I can't it. wait to continue talking so <laughs> I know all right and this is so much fun I can't wait to see where this goes it's it's gonna be great it's gonna go so far I'm gonna send your book to a bunch of my friends so let's definitely stay in touch for sure yes. we will we will thank you so much thank you so much so this fun. is really so much fun bye. thank you bye-bye bye. you can buy the big shebang at bookshop.org and you can find more about Marisa at marisaacocella.com. Thank <laughs> you.